And this is why I want to move then and talk about the other side of the medieval equation, and that is the sort of the root of the doctors um, and the root of uh, the Dominican order, which was primarily promoting this in the, in the 13th and 14th centuries, what I think is kind of the basis on which we think about the organization of the university today. Um, now, the doctors originally were people who were um, trained to administer, doctor in the sense of leading people in various different domains of reality, where we were talking about medicine, law, theology, in the case of being an ecclesiastical, you know, priestly authority. Um, and so, in a sense, what, how knowledge is understood in these cases is very much in the way we think about disciplines today, which is, you know, specific, well-bounded domains of reality. Right, where you're providing a sense of sort of rational organization for something that otherwise might be underdetermined or indeterminate. Um, and so you have this kind of idea, the map of knowledge is divided into different fields, and different specialists are inhabiting the different fields. Okay, and so you specialize and you become a doctor in the area. Now originally, you know, we would now call this kind of way of thinking about things, we would think of, associate this with professional schools. Right? And it's only in the middle to the late 19th century that this kind of mentality then gets brought into the idea of pursuing knowledge for its own sake. Okay, uh, and, and, the P, and, and the, what we call the PhD as a kind of research degree comes into being at that point. Because prior to that point, the doctorate degree was a kind of professional degree to administer over things. So like doctors of medicine, right? We still have these notions, doctors of jurisprudence. Those are the old medieval ideas. Those are the original ideas. It's only in the mid to late 19th century that we start to have, you know, doctors of specific academic disciplines. And this has, and then this is a kind of very interesting sort of transformation in a way in what um, doctorate is and what research is and so forth. And, and we can have an, a discussion about that. Uh, but the idea here was that in the view that was promoted by the doctors, Right, there, is, uh, there are all these different fields, and the way in which you would have interdisciplinarity would be primarily through collaboration. So everybody brings their own expertise to the table, and then you get some sort of collective agreement about things. Now, in the context of the Middle Ages, and getting into the early modern period, this was a formula for maintaining social order. Right? So if you have the people with the doctorates in theology and the doctorates in medicine and the doctorates in law all being able to cooperate with each other and defer to each other when appropriate, you know, uh, and then move, they can move in a sort of common direction and govern society as a whole. Okay, so this was kind of the point of interdisciplinarity in that sense, was as a way of maintaining some kind of governance structure in the society. Now there are now, beyond this kind of point that I'm making here about the difference between the master's and the doctorate degree and the different senses of interdisciplinarity involved, um, there's also a kind of, a, there's a sort of overarching, you might say, theological difference here going on. Um, and, and this, I think, is quite interesting from the standpoint of, of, of what the intellectual project of interdisciplinarity might be. Because the thing about the Franciscans um, and, and their way of pursuing things, which is, tends to want to integrate all the disciplines in the person, is the idea that part of what education is supposed to do is to bring you back to some sort of unity with God, which of course original sin and the fall of Adam and all of that kind of took you away from, and the idea is to recover some sort of divine unity. So that as it were, there is a sense of, of a sort of overarching rational order to the universe Right? And what you're trying to do through interdisciplinarity is to put, it, put the pieces back together again. Now, in the modern period, even though that kind of theology gets sidelined, we of course have, again and again, unity of science movements. And starting with German idealism and, of course, logical positivism in the 20th century. And, and you know, the, the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, why do people even think that knowledge could be unified? That there is some sort of overarching need to integrate disciplines above and beyond what's practical for interdisciplinary research. But there is nevertheless been that very strong drive. 
Okay, uh, and I suppose in one of the most recent incarnations in the last half century has been cybernetics. Right, we're above and beyond any kind of particular practical implication, there is this drive toward unity. So there's a presupposition, obviously, with this, that in some sense, reality is unified at the end of the day, you know, in some sense, it's an ultimate sense, and that there is an intellectual project to be pursued in doing that, which involves somehow integrating the disciplines. Now, the point I want to make about this is I do think this is still a very valuable intellectual project. I think it's actually the strongest case for a permanent interest in interdisciplinarity. Right? In other words, you, I, you, I really, interdisciplinarity as something that goes above just the fashions of funding patterns has to ultimately be based on the idea that there is a unified view of reality and whatever disciplines we're practicing at the moment is only capturing part of that. And that we need greater levels of integration. Okay? If you, and I think that's the strongest argument, but it's an intellectual argument and, it, and it's an argument that has a lot of metaphysical assumptions about the nature of reality and our ability to comprehend it. Okay? And so I want to make, you know, I want to put that on the table. I am very sympathetic to that. But the motivation for doing interdisciplinary today um, is, is, is actually kind of moving in a somewhat different direction. And it's closer to what the doctors uh, are interested in. Okay? Um, and one of the phrases that didn't come up uh, in, in, your, in your introduction, you were talking about all the different phrases that we use, you know, about interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and so forth. You didn't mention transdisciplinarity, okay? Transdisciplinarity. <laughs> and I want to put that on the table. Okay, because transdisciplinarity is very important, rhetorically at least, um, as a way of updating interdisciplinarity. Because see, the thing about interdisciplinarity is that historically, until let's say the last you know, 20 years or so, interdisciplinarity was seen primarily as an intellectually driven project. That's to say, something that came kind of within the academy. And uh, probably the most recent you know, recent way of, of, of talking about this, one doesn't need to go back to the Middle Ages or the German idealists or anything like that, but of course if you look at what was going on in, in the uh, universities, especially when they expanded in the 1960s and afterwards, there was a very strong push for interdisciplinarity, part of it having to do with the fact that there were areas of reality that were not covered by already existing disciplines. And so we talk about, you know, um, well, you know, the rise of things like ethnic studies, gender studies, right, all of these traditionally marginalized groups that nevertheless represent large amounts of reality, but were not captured within the traditional structure of academic disciplines, right, interdisciplinarity then becomes the thing, um, in a way to, you might say, to uh, improve or even realize the universal coverage of knowledge. Okay, and that this may have some very transformative consequences with regard to the academy as a whole. But these kinds of arguments that we often, you know, associate with sort of the, you know, the radical kind of university-based protests of the 1960s were internal to the academy. It was a way in which the university and the academy and the intellectuals reasserted what their purpose was against a kind of society. Okay, and it was in that context in the 1960s that interdisciplinarity was very important and, and a very cutting edge kind of thing. But then as we move into the 1980s and 90s, okay, um, this, this kind of idea sort of morphs and a lot has to do with the way in which um, the political economy of knowledge production changes. Uh, and here, this is where transdisciplinarity starts to become a relevant term for policy purposes. Because the problem with the phrase interdisciplinarity is that it's internally driven, right? It, it says, we've got these disciplines in the academy, and they're, get, and they're putting themselves together on their own terms, realizing that there are areas of knowledge that aren't being covered, and so we have to interact with each other to be able to produce the relevant knowledge. But that is a very much an academic project. It's an, a project of academic self-transformation. But transdisciplinarity implies, in a sense, that the issues come from outside the academy altogether. Right? As it were, there are problems that, you, that academics ought to be dealing with, and they're not dealing with them because they are in these different disciplines. 